So it is our delight to welcome both Pella and Jagan uh, from the California Judicial, uh, Judicial Council of California. And this program really will help us learn more about the design build procurement opportunities that they will have upcoming. And so with that, um, I would encourage everyone to remain on mute when you're not speaking. We do encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat box and also to ask as many questions as you have. We'll be taking some of those questions throughout the presentation, but the majority of the time we'll have at the end of the presentation. Um, and with that, uh, Jagan, would you like to introduce yourself and Pella as well? Thank you. And you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Finally found the button every time we, uh, you know, have a different platform is always in a little bit different place. Um, I'm Paula McCormick. I'm the director of the facility services program at the California um, Judicial Council. Jagan. Thank you, Bella. Uh, I'm Jagan Singh. I'm the principal manager for the facility services uh, with the Judicial Council of California. And apologies for a little technical hiccup in here. I was trying to use my Zoom spacing and I just used on the presentation. Okay. <laughs> Bella, back to you. Okay, thanks, Jagan. So um, the Judicial Council of California is the policy making body for the judicial branch of the California government. Um, the judiciary is charged with interpreting the laws of the state of California in the orderly settlement of disputes between parties in controversy. Um, you know, determining the guilt and innocence of those accused of violating the law and protects the rights of individuals. Um, the California court system is the largest in the nation. It serves over 39 and a half million people and has more than 2,000 judicial officers and 18,000 court employees. Um, the uh, facility services is kind of the full service um, real estate and construction management for the court. So we have approximately 147 full-time equivalents. We're divided into um, essentially six different areas, project management, facilities operations, program support, which kind of is kind of a, includes a bunch of other things, um, you know, risk and environmental compliance, health and safety, fiscal support, sustainability, um, and um, customer service center our and our information centers. We also have a full service real estate group and a security operations and a quality control group. Um, we have a huge variety in our portfolio. Um, our oldest courthouse it was built in 1854 in Mariposa and is still in use today. Um, one of the notable things about this courthouse is it actually still has a wood burning stove in the basement that actually they still use. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also have really big courthouses. So the Clara, Shor Clara Shortridge Fultz Courthouse in Los Angeles, it's 60 courtrooms, over a million square feet. It's our biggest courthouse. Um, and what's interesting about it is about every third floor there is um, essentially a jail, um, a complete lockup to the main criminal courthouse in Los Angeles County. And then we have really small courthouses. This is in Winter Haven, which um, since most of you probably don't know where Winter Haven is, it's tucked away in the corner, the far remote corner of California up against Arizona and the Mexican border. Um, it's just about 2,100 square feet. So um, we have, like I said, a huge variety in our portfolio. Um, next. And the largest project we've completed is in San Diego. And this is a 71 courtroom over 700,000 square feet, and it was completed in 29, or 2018. So not only do we do kind of capital improvements, but we also do a lot of deferred maintenance. So the Judicial um, Council Facilities and Construction Program is actually a fairly new program in that in 2002, um, the state facilities a Court Facilities Act was passed. And what that did is it transferred all the courthouses from counties up until that time, they had been you know, kind of owned and operated by the counties. And in 2002, all those court facilities transferred to the state of California 
and hence the um, beginning of our capital program and our facilities. So we have, um, you know, 450 or so courthouses. Um, most of them were constructed by others and were operated by others up until about 20 years ago. Um, over this 20 year period, we've completed 31 projects. Um, we've spent about $3.3 billion doing that and have added another 324 courtrooms to the uh, portfolio in um, almost 4 million square feet. Um, but that's a very small percentage of my 450 courthouses. So we do a lot of deferred maintenance. We have um, been pretty successful over the past several years in getting deferred maintenance money, but we do have a backlog of, of almost $5 billion in deferred maintenance. Um, some of the newer courthouses that we have just finished is the new Wairika Courthouse for the Siskiyou Court. And it's a five courtroom courthouse. Um, you know, it cost about $77 million with the actual construction contract more than $55 million. Um, the one thing about courthouses, they are complex and they are expensive. Um, so it, it, and it seems to take us a very long time to get these completed. And we have been using up until this time, a um, construction manager at risk approach. And we're looking to change that. Um, next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the interior shots. It's um, just was de um, dedicated this summer. So it's just, you know, very new and um, it's very kind of progressive in, um, you know, having moved them from like a decrepit hundred year old facility, it's um, been a huge change um, for the court. Next, please. Um, this new Sonora Courthouse, we were um, planning on opening it. Um, well, it's open to the public, but we're planning on dedicating it. But uh, you know, this Omnicron thing kind of got in our way with this. So we've postponed that dedication ceremony, unfortunately. Um, but it is another, you know, kind of smallish courthouse, five courtrooms, um, about $69 and a half million dollars with about a $50 million construction um, cost. And, you know, as you can see, most of them are taking, you know, two and a half, three years to get constructed. Next slide, please. Um, these are some of the interior shots. So we're able to do, you know, some fairly nice you know, finishes and, um, you know, trying to really be responsive to the dignity of the law. But we've also kind of made a little bit paradigm um, shift in that we are really trying to um, focus our attention on making sure that we have functional, durable, and maintainable courthouses. Um, next slide, please. Um, so that's what we've been doing this year um, for 2025. 21, 22, um, we have um, been working on our capital program. So we have our five-year capital improvement program, which is um, a requirement for funding and with the Department of Finance. And we went through a fairly detailed assessment of all of our existing facilities and worked with our 58 different jurisdictions to kind of come up with kind of our 80 kind of prime capital projects that need to be performed. Most of these projects are replacement projects. It's very challenging to do construction in an open courthouse. Um, and much of the portfolio is more than 50 years old. So we have a lot of facilities that are kind of at into useful life. Um, so the process we went through was fairly detailed and we did went out, did a bunch of facility condition assessments, as well as interviewed with the courts to really kind of understand what their needs were. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on security and fire life safety, as well as accessibility to kind of really try and define, you know, what are the most needed court um, projects. So we came up with 80 projects, ranked them and put them in an order and have been kind of clicking down the list ever since then. That was in 2019. Um, next, please. So you can go out and all this information is in the public realm, both on the www.courts um, website, as well as the California Department of Finance. You can find the five-year infrastructure plans, not only for the Judicial Council, but for all the other agencies as well. 
So um, what you'll do is you'll have a list and it'll tell you kind of what the projects are and you know, their values. Um, to date, we are down to where the red line is. Um, this year, we, you know, there is a fairly significant um, surplus in the state revenue. So we were awarded uh, three additional projects. So we have five projects that are going to be moving forward um, in 22-23. Next, um, so our active projects, we have um, two, you know, two recently completed and we have eight that are in construction. So up in uh, Redding and Shasta County, we have a 14 courtroom courthouse that's under construction. Um, it's, also, it's a CMR process, it's about a $130 million construction cost. Um, the total project's about 185. Um, you can see kind of the renderings are on the top, the renderings on the right and the, um, the actual courthouse is on the left and it's reversed on the one on the bottom. Uh, next, please. Um, then we also have, uh, you know, courthouses in El Centro. So you can see we, we cover the state. We had an active construction in Siskiyou County in Wairika, and we also have active construction at the El Centro Courthouse in Imperial County. Uh, this is a fairly small courthouse. It's um, four courtrooms, um, you know, about $50 million project. And these will all be coming online later this summer. Next, please. Um, Sacramento Courthouse. Um, this is one of our larger courthouses that we have um, constructed. It's 53 courtrooms. It's about you know $500 million project total cost. It's in downtown Sacramento in an area that's a redevelopment area. It's the old rail yards, and it's right across the street from the federal courthouse. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see, it's going up. Um, and Clark Construction is the contractor on this one. And um, I have to say the um, precast on this is just exquisite. This picture doesn't do it justice. It's um, it almost looks like terrazzo when you get up close to it. Uh, next, please. Um, we also do renovations. They're very difficult. Um, we've had to move the Glen Court into it's essentially module trailers um, to hold court while we do a major renovation of their historic courthouse and add an addition to it. So we're growing it from a one courtroom historic courthouse to a three um, modern courtrooms and hoping to do that for about $42 million. So it's um, coming along. It's kind of your classic looking courthouse in Willows, which is in Glen County, just north of Sacramento. Uh, this is another exciting courthouse project that we have going, which is in Sonoma um, in Santa Rosa. It's a 15 courtroom courthouse. Um, it's about a $200 million project, about $150 million in construction. It's um, just coming out of the ground now. Um, and we've had a little bit of run in. We've had some really heavy rains in Sonoma County. So, um, you know, right at that critical period when we dug a big hole. So I had a, a little bit of challenges there, but um, should be um, ready to occupy, I think, in about two years. Um, we're also just starting the new Modesto Courthouse in Stanislaus County. Um, it's about, you know, $345 million. Um, you know, total project about 244 million in contract cost. And it's just started next, please. And then um, we also have courthouse out in India. We just did the groundbreaking ceremonies um, last week. So we have the five courtroom courthouse for um, in India. And then a another nine courtroom courthouse in Minifee for Riverside County. Um, this one is just a, a, a family law courthouse, so it's a little bit, a little bit different. So uh, next, please. Um, and then we have um, just recently awarded the Criteria Architect for the new Lakeport Courthouse. Um, this is a project that had been put on kind of indefinite delay for oh, several years, and their um, court facility has certainly scored one of like the lowest, if you will, on um, our facility condition assessments. So we are um, really help 
you know, really looking forward to getting this replaced. It's the first one that we're going to be trying kind of our new design build. We just um, got the authority this past um, legislative session. So we are really looking forward to rolling this out. Um, and Jagan will talk to you a little bit later about um, what we're doing and how we're trying to do that. But this project's proposed to be about 46,000 square feet and cost about $73 million. Um, we also have a, another project that was you know, long delayed in, to replace the historic Mendocino um, County Courthouse, which parts of it are over 100 years old. So it's um, really past its prime. Um, this court facility um, the, has an annex that the floors don't even align. So for you know, universal accessibility is almost impossible. Um, it doesn't even have elevators to all floors. Um, so it's about you know, 82,000 square feet, seven courtrooms. Um, it's also going um, interesting um, into an old rail yard in downtown Ukiah. And then um, we also have the new Fort Ord Courthouse that will be starting. This is going to be a replacement to the Monterey Courthouse, which is um, a seven courtroom facility. And um, we're, we're doing a site acquisition on this particular project. And most of our upcoming projects are all going to require acquisitions as well. And for state agency, it's rel relatively challenging to do acquisitions. They tend to really lengthen the projects, but um, we will um, hopefully be um, finding some good sites and uh, getting this thing launched here in the very near future. We also do a little bit of renovation work. Um, this is at, up in Orville at the Butte Juvenile Hall. Um, the juvenile courts in many instances are attached to um, juvenile halls or um, you know, juvenile detention facilities and are typically kind of one or two courtroom operations um, that are you know, basically uh, adjacent to detention facilities. So this one has, uh, you can see from the picture, is uh, time for some serious work to be done on it. Um, a lot of the juvenile facilities are in pretty rough shape. Um, next, please. Um, and then this is San Bernardino Juvenile Dependency Courthouse. And um, it's um, interesting with the dependency is kind of, you know, as uh, one of the judges explains it, it's um, dependency is, you know, kind of bad parents and juvenile delinquency is, you know, bad kids. So there are a lot of families that are, you know, in these courtrooms and this one is really heavily used. Um, we're just adding two courtrooms. It'll bring it up to a six courtroom facility, but, um, you know, so it's a, uh, a little tight squeeze right now. Um, next, please. Um, one of the other really interesting things we're doing is a master plan for the Los Angeles court. Um, the Los Angeles court is one of the largest court jurisdictions in the country, um, it serves you know, 10 million people. They have 43 different um, facilities. And most of their facilities are 40 years old or older and are going to be need to, needing replacement but they're very large courthouses. So the emphasis on this particular study is how do we go about you know, um, sequencing and planning the logistics to be able to not impact the program needs of the Los Angeles court while we're going about replacing some of their largest courts, um, the um, Claire Shortwood Foltz Courthouse, which you know, is our largest in our system. Um, needs a major renovation. And then the Stanley Moss Courthouse, which is um, uh, has a hundred family you know, courtrooms, needs um, probably a complete replacement. So you have 160 plus courtrooms at, at some point um, need to be offline. So trying to figure out how you sequence that is really kind of the emphasis on this one. Um, we've got about another year and a half to get that sorted out and figured out. Um, next, please. And then we do a, a other kind of small interesting study here for the uh, Nevada City, for the Nevada court. They have this um, lovely old historic art deco courthouse that is just 
completely undersized for what they need and you know it's lacking in pretty much every kind of contemporary best practice of how to run a court um, but the community loves that courthouse and so how do you you know build a gigantic courthouse you know either adjacent to this thing as an annex or relocate it so trying to sort through um, many of those issues um, with the study for the Nevada City courthouse. Um, we also were rewarded pretty well here in the governor's proposed budget. So um, I'll give you a quick budget less, less lesson in uh, what on January 10th, the governor puts his budget proposal out. And then the next couple of months we spend debating with the legislature and ledge analyst office to really kind of work through the proposals to um, you know, really kind of refine. And then by June 15th, the um, legislature should be bringing back their final budget to the governor for his signature. And, um, and then the budget becomes active on July 1st. So the next several months, we'll be sorting through these projects with um, through budget hearings, et cetera. So next slide, please. Um, so we've got five projects in the budget and most of them are fairly large and all of them will need acquisition. So that's going to you know, add some time to them. But we have the new Solano Hall of Justice, which will be in Fairfield, um, you know, which is kind of the um, East Bay area. We also have a very large courthouse um, for Fresno. We need to replace their main courthouse um, in downtown Fresno. Um, so it's a 36 courtroom courthouse. Um, it'll need, you know, a full city block and probably seven or eight stories. Um, next, please. And then a um, smaller courthouse up in Quincy for Plumas County. Um, they're in a, another one of these hundred year old historic courthouses that's just completely undersized and out of alignment with kind of best practices. So um, we'll hope to get that replaced. Um, and then we kind of start that process of breaking the log jam down in the Los Angeles court, the new Santa Carita courthouse out in Santa Carita's, um, you know, 24 courtroom courthouse, um, it'll be $500 million plus. Um, and are um, looking to start that one in an acquisition. Um, and we also have um, for all the Cal Poly grads out there, the San Luis Obispo um, courthouse, uh, replacement courthouse for 12 courtrooms. And I think that is all I have for kind of the portfolio. And I'm gonna switch it over to Jagan to talk to you a little bit about what our upcoming opportunities are and what um, you know um, our new design build um, method is going to be. So Jagan. Thank you, Pella. So um, first of all, I wanna thank the architectural community or the design community for being very interested in our projects. Uh, we, in the last three or four months, have completed uh, the criteria architect for our five projects that are currently ongoing. And, uh, and the response that we got was great. And a lot of people came to our pre-proposal uh, meetings. So with that said, I'm going to talk about what current opportunities or current contracts we ha have and what other uh, opportunities we have in addition to the capital program. So in terms of our current contracts, we have what we call is an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contracts for architectural engineering firms. And the projects on that range anywhere from, you know, $25,000 all the way to $10 million. And the 31 firms that we currently have under contract, we originally signed a base contract of three years and then that expired last year. And then we renewed with a two year option that the owner had or the judicial council had. So we had renewed that. So just some stats on that majority of the firms that were selected under the IDIQ were small and mid-sized firms. So in addition to our capital projects, which are pretty big, we have smaller facility modifications, which is anything related to non uh, increase of the space. So if you're not increasing the space, it becomes a facility modification. Uh, roof replacements, elevator modernizations, fire alarm upgrades, um, tenant improvements, changing things, you know, pretty much everything that we do where design and state fire marshal is required, 
we do uh, use AE firms in that. In addition to the, our architectural engineering consulting contracts, we had other engineering consulting contracts as well. And some of the architectural firms, which are multidisciplinary, have those contracts, like the mechanical plumbing, roof consulting, structural engineering, electrical, and the vertical transportation consulting services. A lot of times, we first start doing an assessment and then follow it up by actual design and then into the construction. So these contracts are really great for us and uh, I would strongly recommend everybody to uh, participate in that. Our future of these contracts when they are gonna open up are given in here. Majority of them are gonna be quarter three of next year. Uh, so please be, uh, actually it should be next year, uh, yes. I, I think this is incorrect, 2024, it should be 2023. So those are our new FM contracts that are coming up. In terms of our capital projects that are coming up or have already been out, we have, um, in terms from the design community, we have the criteria architect and the design build uh, entity selection, which includes the AOR. And so far we have selected Lakeport, Ukiah, Fort Ord, Nevada City. And when we get, we are gonna get into the, design build phase on this, there is gonna be an opportunity for the community to, uh, to submit for this. So the Lakeport one is gonna come out in the next quarter itself. And uh, we expect that to be sometime in May timeframe. Uh, it could move forward or backward. The Ukiah one is probably gonna be quarter three at this time. And it's also subject to funding through the budget act because that phase is being proposed in our current budget year uh, in the and the uh, budget proposal. The Fort Ord is gonna take a little longer because we have a site acquisition ongoing. For Lakeport and Ukiah, we currently both have the sites available and that's why we are moving much faster. The Fort Ord is gonna be sometime next year. The Nevada City Courthouse study, once it completes, then we are gonna submit uh, to the Department of Finance whether we are gonna renovate the existing facility uh, or we are gonna build a brand new facility. So we already have the criteria architect selected, but the, the selection of the DBE post that, whatever option we pick, whether it's a renovation of the existing facility uh, or modernization of the existing facility or a brand new facility will come out sometime quarter one of 2024. The five projects that are proposed in this year's budget, uh, we looking at getting the proposals out for the criteria architect uh, RFPs out sometime in uh, quarter three of this year. And then since each one of them has a acquisition which spans about two years, in some cases it could span three, uh, we have kind of plugged in our tentative dates for now when we would be selecting the AORs. In terms of the criteria architect selection which has already been posted, so you guys can go and take a look at the current um, uh, RFP, the contract, and all that information on our website, and uh, we'll have a link for it in this presentation. Uh, basically, what we are looking for is the criteria design team experience within the team that being proposed, and we give it a 15 point weight. The planning and programming expertise is another 15 points. Key personnel is another 15 percent, uh, or 15 points, sorry, not percent. Uh, technical expertise of the team is another 15 and the management approach to the project is another 15. We do the interviews and we also do the reference check. Now the interviews and the reference check in, it, in itself do not uh, get any points, but what they do is they give us an opportunity to go back and refine the score that we have seen from your proposal. And then finally, there's a fee proposal component, which is 25% given to, uh, to the selection of the, um, uh, best value firm. So key takeaways that we at least saw from our current um, current criteria architect uh, at, uh, procurements, which we haven't seen previously because our pre previous procurements were done way earlier, is that the key person that you're proposing should be more involved in the interview. If you are bringing your project manager who is the day-to-day -day person and he's not speaking much, uh, that's not going to be viewed very favorably by the uh, selection team. And then research on the project for which you are submitting. Some of the firms basically just had a boilerplate uh, proposal template, which they had set and they just submitted it all together. 
Uh, same thing for every project that we were seeing. So they weren't specifically tailoring it to each project and each project is unique and separate. So we recommend that when you are uh, submitting on a pr project that you research on that project and then uh, know when you're submitting. And then this is more for the uh, DBE selection, you know, the culture fit between the design build contractor and the, and the architect needs to be really there. We wanna see you guys have worked together in the past in some capacity, you guys should have known each other and worked together for us to, uh, to evaluate that. And this will be part of our selection criteria during the design build that will be coming out. Another key thing that we are looking for is innovation to the project. A lot of our projects take much longer to complete. And what we are looking at is how can we shorten not just the, the design portion, but also the construction portion. So it'll be really important for the design build uh, entities to come up with what are they bringing as an innovation to the project. And there is gonna be points given to the innovation um, factor when you are submitting as a DBE. So that will be really important. Another key thing to keep in mind is the conflict of interest. Uh, a lot of, uh, lot of architects reached out to us previously related to the criteria architect uh, procurement when they were the selected firm previously, they have worked on the project. Uh, as a, when the project was in a different shape. So as Pella said, Lakeport and Ukiah had been held up for a while and now they're rebooting. So based on the government core, there is a conflict of interest issue uh, that people needs to keep in mind. And then also being on the criteria side and the DBE side, you need to be able to uh, make sure that there's no conflict of interest on that. So post-selection, what we really look at is accuracy in your work, the speed of delivery, how fast can you deliver, and how good of a relationship, working relationship you have with the state fire marshal. Now we all know they're the most critical factor in delivering the project. And a lot of our projects sometimes are stuck in the, in the plan review process for a little bit. So this is gonna be a, a really important uh, item. Uh, and then Pella touched on it that, you know, previously we were, or at least the judicial council direction was that we, we want to go and, you know, we want to build something. Now the building has to reflect the dignity of the law, but that doesn't mean that we need to be building opulent buildings. We don't want to build Taj Mahal's. We are looking for a functional, durable, and operational buildings. Part of the things is because we are maintaining the buildings and we have a tight budget on that, we are focusing more on how to get the best life cycle value out of the things that we are putting in. So the focus on, on our newer projects is gonna be more on the functional, durable, durable and operational and less on building these temples of justices. Uh, I'm gonna actually go back to, there was a question in the chat which says what opportunities are there for the small firms. And I did mention in our previous couple of slides and I'll go back here is to come back and apply to our IDIQ contracts, uh, which is basically up to projects of $10 million. And so I would strongly encourage, we have a lot of work in Southern California, uh, more so than on the Northern California because majority of our portfolio is in Southern California. So I would highly recommend you guys to apply for it. Keep an eye open for the, for the new uh, solicitations that are posted on our site. And we'll get into that in a minute. So what to expect in a solicitation? We will have a request for proposal. You will see a standard agreement. There will be administrative rules governing those requests for proposal, but uh, our standard agreements will be part of our RFP. And then all the other, um, you know, backup information that's needed. And we are asking the A firms to provide the qualifications in the standard form 330 for, uh, this is more using the federal uh, form to, to qualify so we can see apples to apples across the different, different firms. Okay, so then the question is, where can we go and find the solicitations? So all our solicitations are posted for, um, on our website, courts.ca.gov slash rfps.htm. 
And so this is a screenshot of our, uh, of our website from yesterday. And basically you can scroll, like if you go on the website, you can scroll all the way down to 2016. All our uh, solicitations are posted. You can see here the criteria services for the LA master plan, criteria services for new Fort Ord, and, uh, and then everything is posted in here and we communicate it. So I would strongly encourage our uh, design community to reach out uh, to our website and, and track what is coming on. Uh, David, um, thank you, Will. And David, you have a question. Do you have a template design build agreement you can share? Not currently. We are about to finalize our design build agreement templates and we will definitely uh, post it on our website as the new solicitation comes. It will just be barely in time. We are doing uh, J, uh, just in time manufacturing as well. So same way we are just finishing up our contract for the design build agreement and that would be posted. But we'll talk about a couple of things in there that would be helpful for the design community today to, to know. So design build delivery method. Um, we are shifting, uh, as Pella said, we have 31 projects delivered so far on construction manager at risk, and we are making the shift towards the design build. And um, there, there have been a lot of lessons learned from delivering the, the construction managers um, at risk. One is the contractors, typically the CMR, by the time we get them, it's kind of too, too late. Um, and uh, so we don't get that value. And then Two is that most of these CMR firms are competing on the price or the proposal fees. So they basically really shrink down their fees for the pre-construction services. And as a result of that, we get very poor pre-construction services from them. And then it really becomes, you know, the constructability review, I'll give you an example on one of our larger projects. We only had 300 comments from a CMR on a larger project and compare that with a you know, much smaller project, uh, we got a lot more. Uh, so there's a huge variation in terms of what, what kind of pre-construction services we get from, from the contractors. And then it becomes whether it's a value analysis or are we just caught cost cutting because that gets into it. And especially the way our contracts are written, you know, if things are, if the CMR could have caught on it reasonably during the pre-construction services, they are required to cover that risk for us. But we see a lot of time there's no ownership of the design omission. And once we get the GMP, it becomes more like a you know, low bid job. It's like everything is a change. And then uh, you know, that becomes a challenge. We are playing referee between, the, between the, uh, both the architect and the CMR. And that has really been a, a, a push to move towards the design build. So one of the def uh, definite benefits that we see with the design build is that we can start construction earlier and there would be more integration between the design firm and the builder. So, and our, um, you know, our uh, focus will shift towards making decisions early and getting the subcontractors part of it into the discussion at an earlier stage because we are, during our design build process, we are providing, uh, requiring the contractor to provide some listed contractors as well. So moving on into our design build process outline, and I'm gonna focus on some things a little bit more and the rest of the stuff, which I don't think impact the design build, uh, design team uh, community here, I'm gonna kind of move a little faster from there. So really we are looking at three phases, the acquisition phase, the criteria phase, and the design build phase. The criteria architect is brought in right at the acquisition phase uh, if we don't have an existing site. So we select the criteria architect, then we use the criteria architect's help to evaluate sites and select a proposed site, which also includes from our side environmental one uh, testing and report. And we also look at uh, uh, putting together other key aspects in the site selection, like the utilities, the geotag, um, you know, development cost. If if it is a if it is a green field site, all that is evaluated. We take it to CFAC. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, 
Judicial Council is governed by a lot of community uh, committees. So we have a court facilities advisory committee, which makes all our decisions. We as staff just take our recommendations to the committee and then the committee has to make a decision. They approve it or not approve it. On the facility modification side, which is the projects where we are not adding any square footage, but we could be doing tenant improvements like build out a courtroom, that all goes through the trial court facility modification advisory committee. So everything we do typically goes to one committee or another. So here CFAC is used as a placeholder for either CFAC or CCRS. CCRS is California Courthouse Cost Reduction Subcommittee, which is under the CFAC uh, as a bigger umbrella committee, a subcommittee under them. So we need to get an approval from them. Then we go through the Department of Finance slash State Public Works Board approval. We acquire the site, we again approve, get approval from the CFAC and then move to actually complete the site acquisition. So majority of the work during the acquisition that the criteria architect is gonna be doing is site test fits, looking at the different site and seeing which one works best, where the entry points and the exit, exit points work best for, for, uh, for them, uh, for, for the design, is the site functional or not? Uh, and then doing some programming. And the programming sometimes overlaps with the criteria and that's kind of uh, a gray line where it actually uh, resides, whether it resides in the, in the acquisition or in the criteria. But the criteria phase is we should have finalized our, uh, all our criteria documents. We are not looking for an intensive bridging documents, but very high level documents, which we are gonna use uh, for our DBE firms. And uh, really on this, um, the programming should have started here and kind of finalized by here. Sometimes these can run concurrently as well. Once the criteria documents are established, then we get CFAX approval, State Public Works Board approval, and then we issue the RFP. While we are doing this, you can see we are already pre-qualifying the DBEs and we'll talk a little bit more about it by the RFQ process. It's a two-step process. We are gonna shortlist three to five firms uh, of the DBE, which are then gonna be issued these RFPs. So we are not having multiple people, uh, you know, move forward in the step. It's, it becomes hard to evaluate also. So uh, one thing on the design bill that we are doing, we are not doing a stipulated sum. What we are doing is a best value design, uh, design build. And we'll talk what that means for us in a little bit as we go forward. So we will have a pre-proposal meeting, confidential meetings, which we are looking for to mostly talk about the target GMP. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go further along. Um, and uh, then we just basically have our technical team review, uh, meet with the DBEs, review, give us a brief to the interview panel, interview team reviews, uh, interviews and ranks the DBEs. And then we negotiate with the DBEs in the ranking order on the target GMP. And once the target GMP is confirmed, then we actually move into approval processes and we issue the contract. We start with the schematic, we get CFAC approval on the schematic design. The DBE procures trades that are listed for the design at that time, and then finish with the, with the DD. And what we are doing is two phases, phase one, phase two, phase one that goes into the uh, state fire marshal, 100% needs to be approved before we get the GMP. But then we get the GMP and once we have the GMP, we move forward into working drawings and construction. So you can start construction at the same time you're working, uh, doing the working drawings uh, on that aspect. So, and then th this is the part after the GMP is given, uh, you know, where you have finally then the other trade contracts and other stuff in that portion. So what are we looking for in the criteria documents? So if you are working as a criteria architect, this is important because, or if you're planning on applying as a criteria architect for the projects that are gonna come up, uh, this is what we are looking for in terms of the criteria. Um, architectural program, fully completed, conceptual site layouts, blocking and setting, uh, stacking diagrams. Uh, and then by reference, our California trial court facility standards, and then anything that we wanna add or restrict to the California trial code facility standards. If you're building a building in Wairika, that's gonna to be totally different than the building that you're gonna build up in El Centro, which is in Imperial, two different weather zones or climate zones. And so there would be some things you wanna restrict maybe from a, from a mechanical perspective. 
So those are the additions or restrictions that we want to add to the facility standards. And then our concept on this is the project cost model or the target GMP. As Pella said earlier, we have the 31 different um, uh, projects that we have completed. So uh, what we have done is we have taken the information from each one of those projects that we have completed, the cost model, and plugged it in to our, uh, into our database, which has then been baseline to Sacramento and uh, 2016, but we are gonna uh, reset it to 2021, but baseline everything to Sacramento with the 2021. And then from there, we are picking up to a market factor and the year escalation. And that's how the target GMP has developed. And we'll go into a little bit more detail, but not a whole lot more. Uh, geotech report, uh, standard, the CEQA report. We will finish the CEQA once acquiring the site. And then there's a threat report that our uh, security group does and some division one um, specifications. Architectural program, I think everybody pretty much knows it. We have standardized it. So on all projects going forward, we have a set template that we wanna use. So far, we were getting all different kind of uh, programming files from everybody across the project. So all the 31 projects, things were not being called consistently, things were not you know, set in a particular format. So we have now established a standard for our architectural program, and that is going to be uh, that is going to be uh, moving forward with it. Uh, so uh, th there's going to be more focus on standardizing things. Uh, conceptual site layouts, uh, basically in and outs. Can you enter, exit? Or does it have space for judges' um, entrance, exit, in custody entrance, exit, service entrance? Uh, public parking, right? And then the blocking and the stacking, how does that relate from a conceptual perspective? Now the DBE is totally free to use a different type of blocking and stacking. This is just to show that the existing site works, right? Uh, our preferred template is four courtrooms per floor and that would be restricted as we go forward because that's the ideal thing that we have found after so many projects that we have done. And the best thing works is when you have a single loaded corridor, public corridor, for the four courtrooms and a secure corridor in the backside. This was the cost model uh, that uh, I was talking about. And uh, I wanna focus here. So basically this will be a target GMP that will be provided out to everybody. Uh, this is the cost that we are gonna provide basically. And it is gonna be broken down by the CSI master division format. Uh, which is going to talk about A10, A20, A2030, C10, 2030, D10, 2030, and so forth and so on. And based on our 31 courtroom facility database that we have, we have very, you know, we have a very good database to pull this information out once it's been baselined, right? So what we are asking the DVE to do is provide this one. Um, template the target GMP cost at the time of the submission. So the, the design build entity will provide this and this is where we will review intensively with the design build entities on where your costs land. And then this is where the final GMP will land, you know, towards the end of the GD. And obviously between the target GMP and the DBE GMP, uh, we will be tracking this cost at every phase uh, pretty much on a very regular basis. These are the fees that uh, the DBE will be providing at an upfront stage. So that way we can compare uh, where things are landing across each DBE. So, uh, and this will becomes important, right? So the exterior enclosure, we have 46 million. So we have certain assumptions over there and we wanna hear what those assumptions are from the DBE. We are not requesting the design firms to do any design. There is really no design required on uh, when we go into the design build. There's no design required for you to be selected. We are requiring a rendering and we'll talk about it a little bit more, uh, but that rendering, the only reason exterior rendering we are requiring is if you are showing curtain wall on your rendering and your exterior enclosure does not take that into account, that's where we wanna know where your target GMP costs are. Those will be the internal confidential discussions that will be happening 
with each of the firms. Uh, the California Trial Court Facility Standards, um, you know, th those have been updated in 2020. So our current initiative is to update uh, our standards to the courthouse of the future with some of the remote uh, proceedings to happen. Uh, as the legislature allows us to do more things, those things will trickle in into our facility standards. Right now, it's still uh, a pilot initiative that, that has been taken over. Uh, geotech reports, uh, CEQA reports, everybody knows that. Uh, this is typically your risk assessment reports that will be provided. And then we are providing a minimum uh, amount of division one specs where we wanna know or we wanna control what, what is in there. Post this, all the division one specs, uh, division two specs are gonna be done by the DBE as we move forward. So DBE, um, two-step selection with the best value approach. Um, in the RFQ, it's going to be two parts. The first part is uh, pre-qualification. If you answer no on any of that questions, you basically fail. We will not evaluate your proposal after that. The second section, but if you pass, then the second section is a scored section where we look at the qualifications from the builder and the AE firms, and then we basically give a scoring. And based on those scores, then we are shortlisting three to five firms. So that is the bar that we are putting together right there. So the criteria documents then will be issued to these shortlisted firms, and they are going to be providing in the proposal the following things. Organization of the project team, experience of the key team members, staffing plan during the pre-construction phase and the construction phase, project management plan, analysis of the target GMP. We were talking about this a little bit before. We are going to really focus on where you believe your costs are going to land and how you uh, come to that. If you're thinking you're gonna use a curtain wall envelope, then your target GMP should reflect that. If you think if you're gonna use precast, that should reflect that. For a smaller building, if you're proposing stucco, that should reflect that. If you're proposing stone, that should reflect that. That's why we are asking for a conceptual rendering of the building consistent with the proposed target GMP. So that's the only thing that the design firms need to do in addition to discussion uh, about the different, um, uh, different systems to build the target GMP model with the, with the design build entity. Obviously the project schedule, the cost proposal, which lists all the fees from the, uh, from the pre-construction and the construction phase, and then the listed subcontractors. Uh, we, we would need to know who your listed subcontractors are at the RFP phase. So uh, there's a question in here, is there gonna be any stipends? So one of the reasons why we moved away from uh, uh, stipulated some design bill where uh, our design competition, quite frankly, is because of the feedback that we were getting from the design community that you know we are spending a lot of money to pursue these projects and we still don't get the value. Like if you don't get uh, selected, then you're basically losing the money, even with a stipend, it's not covering the cost. So we have moved away from that idea. So we are not doing any design competition. And so there is not really any, um, any uh, stipends. There's also a question related to progressive model for design build on any of these projects. We do not have any authority for a progressive design build. We have an authority for the best value design build and that's the approach we are using. So in, in short, no, we are not using progressive design build. Uh, and then there is, uh, are there any sustainability goals? So our standards are fairly uh, recent and they have the goals of the sustainability and uh, they also call out, and then specifically on any project, uh, on any dependent project, we will have specific goals for, for them. But uh, I can't say that there's any uh, particular goals that we have set. Our, uh, uh, our minimum standard is that uh, we are building lead buildings. Uh, and I, I think the minimum is a lead uh, certified or silver. I'm, I'm not sure what we currently have in our standards. Okay. Um, Moving on to the design bill contract. Some of the key things that the team needs to be aware of. We are asking for a GMP at 100% design development. For you guys to give us a GMP at 100% design development with our target GMP established and carrying it forward, uh, these drawings need to be 
fully developed to a DD level, if not more. Past what we have seen is some of the architectural projects, um, DD's level has not been achieved. Um, and that is that is not uh, that is not going to work in this delivery model. And then the phase one packet that needs uh, at 100% DD needs to be approved by the state fire marshal. And we'll talk about that and you can get more information on that from the state fire marshal website. But that's the key feature. The second thing is the risk sharing. A lot of our projects have been subject to delays. Some of them reasonably, we can say, were attributed to some issue with the AHJ and some we would believe are where the design firms are probably not paying attention. So what we have done is in terms of the, uh, in terms of our AHJ delay for any extra time, unreasonable code interpretations, we will share the risk with the DBE at 50% each. So let's say there was nine months that took, uh, I think we are specifying a certain time for the DBE to take into consideration for approval from the AHJ. So let's say if that's six months and it went to nine months, so that out of that nine months, uh, three months is the unreasonable delay, we will share that 50% with the DBE. But that's only if it is an AHJ delay and not because your drawings were not complete. Uh, and if there's any unreasonable code interpretations, no, we want you to do X, Y, and Z. No, uh, we will share that as well. And then in the second biggest risk is about the AHJ making the changes during the construction. And that has happened on some of the projects, right? So we wanna go to a point where we don't have to do that. Some of the things that we have seen as some of the design team become very creative in coming up with uh, solutions which might skirt that minimum code requirement or might not really work there. And that state fire marshal has taken a uh, a very hard stance against. So, uh, and that will be covered in the next couple of slides. But if, if after all reasonable stuff has been done, the AHJ still makes changes during the construction, we will share that risk 50-50 with the design build entity and the judicial council. And then finally, we have a project contingency, which we are gonna share the savings at 25% to the DBE and 75% to the judicial council. So whenever you are teaming up with a design build entity, you should know that so that, you know, you know that there is a shared saving that if you want to participate in that with the design build entity, which is the builder, then you, you know that that is something that could be done. So talking about the state fire marshal two step plan review. And before that, I'm going to answer Will's question. Uh, will we get the authority from the legislature for the procurement methods? And we do not currently have authority for the design build. Um, progressive design build, DGS just got, I think, as a pilot for maybe one or two projects. They don't have it as a, as a whole. And at this point, we don't anticipate getting any authority to move towards the uh, progressive design build. Um, So there's a question saying, please confirm that um, um, IDIQ, that you need to become an IDIQ prior to submitting on any projects, design build or traditional delivery with the next cycle. Uh, no, that is not the case. Uh, you don't wanna be on IDIQ, you don't have to be. If you're qualified to be on the, on the criteria architect design build or any traditional delivery method, we will select you. But I'll tell you, if it is a smaller project, about 10 million or less, we are going to go into our IDIQ list to tap into that because we don't have to go through the whole procurement process again. And that's the benefit of it. But if you don't want to apply, that's fine. Whatever comes out for an open solicitation, you're still eligible to apply. Andrew is saying what you're describing is closer to the progressive design bill, much different than the stipulated sum. That is correct. And that's why we are using the best value design build method. We are not progressive. Uh, because uh, people will interpret it in a different manner. And so I'm shying away from saying that we are doing design build in uh, progressive design build in any fashion, we are not. 
Okay. Um, Moving further along, the state fire marshal two-step process, this is defined by the state fire marshal now. It used to be four phases where you can submit four different packets, but now it's cut down to two. Um, and uh, basically the phase one design package is the code analysis, fire protection report, civil grading and utilities and foundations. There's a lot more detail in what the state fire marshal wants to see. Uh, so go to their website, download it for the design build, and this is gonna be the same uh, for us. And this is this package is supposed to be 100% going to the state fire marshal before we get the GMP. The phase two design package, which will be submitted after the GMP, is architectural, full structural, electrical, plumbing, mechanical. Now we do expect this all to be 100% DD, if not more, at the time of the GMP. So uh, I want to take. I know we have a uh, half an hour, and I'll get to your questions in a minute. I see still. Uh, one more coming in there. Birds, so state fire marshal issues, what we have seen in the, in the past. Biggest issue with the state fire marshal that we are seeing on our projects, uh, especially in the last round is the egress issues. Horizontal exits, um, exit enclosures, do we have the right occupant um, counted in the, uh, in, in the, in the plans? So there are specific things for our courthouse uh, that the state fire marshal has kind of agreed to, right? So we know the well is gonna be one by 40, uh, one person per 40 square feet. We know there that uh, behind the bar, there is gonna be uh, fixed seating and there is a calculation for the fixed seating. So they are looking at a very conservative approach. One of the disconnects that we found is the state fire marshal thinks that the code is the minimum and you gotta do above it. And the design firm comes and says, we meet the code and that's all we need to do. So state fire marshal is looking at, hey, it's the minimum, you gotta do better here, buddy. And they're saying, well, we just met the code and we met the code, so we are good in here. So I think that's a big disconnect between the design community and the state fire marshal. And um, I think on as an owner side, I wanna move things fast because the longer it stays, the longer you go back and forth, it's costing us money, escalation money. Uh, if you have just seen this year, we have crazy amount of escalation in this year in itself. So to avoid that, what we are saying, plan for more than the minimum code. So one of the things that you will see, and that would be coming out in the criteria for the Lakeport Courthouse, which is coming shortly, is that we are requiring wider stairs. We are saying add 20% capacity to the stairs. Add an extra set of stairs. A lot of time we have to end up in working drawings adding one or even two stairs to satisfy the state fire marshal requirements. So I think we have as an owner taken a stance, let's do more than code minimum so that we don't run into these issues with the state fire marshal and we move through the plan review process much faster. Uh, one of the things that absolutely helps is rating the public and the secure corridor, which are both corridors uh, uh, that are going to be accessed either by the public or from the secure side by the staff slash the judicial officers. So rating that reduces a lot of issues. I know it's a costly thing, but we don't want to be in the construction and then have to rate the corridors and spend a ton of amount of money on that. And then the another biggest thing that has come up right now is that the UL assemblies are not followed. So we want the design firms to come up with a UL assembly that they are gonna follow to a T or the builder is gonna follow to a T and not deviate from it. State Farm Marshall has not been accepting those. And in those cases, they have been requiring testing. So if you are not gonna use a UL assembly, put that in, that you're gonna test the assembly and that you're gonna move forward um, move forward with that. Uh, so that is some high level state fire marshal issues. And I think that's kind of the end of my presentation. And let's see, there were still a couple of questions here. Uh, Mark is saying, but the program is not flexible to meet the TVD. I don't follow that question. So Mark, if you wanna elaborate on that, I can answer it. Um, 
Will, you are saying, uh, oh, you're just asking people to react. This is Judicial Council committed to making sure the new projects are 100% electric, which will help advance our collective statewide decarbonization goals. Uh, we have not made that commitment to be 100% electric at this time, Will, uh, but I think all the codes and all the jurisdictions are moving towards that. So I think it's just a matter of time before that actually becomes a part of our uh, standards. Uh, will the requirements that are above and beyond the code be specified in the RFP? Yes, uh, they are gonna be specified in the RFP. It, it's gonna be in the criteria document. So the criteria documents will state, you need to design the stairs to 20%. I'm not saying 20% wider stair, I'm saying 20% more capacity than what your uh, occupant load is. So if your occupant load is uh, 300, design the stairs for 360 people and uh, move forward with that. Um, and then in terms of stairs, we, we already know you need a minimum of four stairs on a tower, a minimum of four. And then the podium adds more if you're building a podium. So those things will be uh, spelled out. Now on a smaller, scale one or two story building, it's not as critical, but as you build a mid to a larger size uh, courthouse, somewhere, you know, eight, 10, 12, uh, 15, 20 courtroom courthouses, then it becomes really critical for that. Uh, okay, so I think I'm caught up on my questions. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, thank you so much. Um... Yeah, with regards to my 100% electric, I, I do think that's something that um, from the AIA's perspective, that would be a win-win. So hopefully you will sort of put that into place. Uh, Mark McVeigh, can you share a little bit more about what you meant with regards to the, the TVD? <clears throat> yeah, so I was um, trying to describe the progressive design build process post-award. Um, the, both the program and the cost are developed um, are, are refined together with the design build entity and the client. But I, I'm trying to understand if there is a similar thought process with JCC in their selection process that that program could also be somewhat flexible or is it just um, finding the best um, uh, design solution with a fixed program? Yeah, our program, uh, thank you, Mark, for that question. Our program is not going to change. Our program is fixed, and that's why we're giving you a very fixed program. Our requirements are the requirements we've met with the court. Uh, there might be some optional uh, programming requirements, but those will be spelled out in the program. But for the most part, we can't change a 24 courtroom courthouse to a 20 courtroom courthouse. And all the associated spaces that are required with those courtrooms are already calculated to a minimum based on our standards. So there's very little, if any, deviation from the program that we will be providing. Okay, understood. Jack, and this is Will again. And, you know, I, I do look forward to everyone on the call having a chance to ask questions and share comments. But, you know, one question I have, and this is something that I asked, uh, you know, I ask all public agencies, you know, what, what is their burden with regards to utilities because I feel like if you're really aiming only for silver or LEED certified, you're not really doing enough to really save on your utility bill when you could be looking at net zero energy or other ways that you're really doing more on-site um, renewables. And I'm just wondering, like, what resources do you need to really drive yourself that way so that you are having a, a lower life cycle cost with the, you know, the operational burden of your, of your program? So we are looking at renewals, renewables, like solar panels are being included, but you know, running a whole building of this size uh, as a net zero is gonna be a pretty hard task. Um, and, uh, but eventually we will get to that as things become better, right? So we are already trying to find ways where uh, we have issues currently with the power safety, power shutoffs every summer uh, in our courthouses, which are spread throughout the Central Valley in Northern California. And for that, we are looking at some options of uh, battery storages and stuff like that, that could help. But the initial cost on those, mm -hmm. I mean, the funding is the biggest factor that has to be considered, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Ella, you want to add anything else? Um, yeah, I think you've hit it pretty much right on. You know, one of the, the challenges for us is as an owner, we operate these facilities long term. And <clears throat> there is reluctance to move into something that is kind of cutting edge innovative. We really want to know that when we purchase a system of some sort, that it has some dependability and is going to be in for the long haul. So you know, that I think is one thing that there's been a lot of reluctance to be an early adapter of some of these newer cutting edge technologies. Um, we keep our buildings for a hundred years. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that it's going to be around. Well, I, I definitely hope that, you know, as you start to evaluate the teams that are submitting that you're looking at, you know, those solutions, because, you know, if, if we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. And, and, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's a you know, from the architecture perspective, I think it, we're, we're adamant about the, the highest energy performance that we can possibly attain today because, you know, operational costs and life cycle costs are really, um, from a taxpayer burden point of view, uh, you know, truly essential. Um, anybody else on the call have any questions or comments regarding? So, Bill, I want to add to what you were saying. So, in our standards, the 2020 standards, we do have a requirement to look at the life cycle analysis for everything, right? And that talks about uh, what works. So when we are evaluating the design firms uh, or when we are working with the design firm, they'll have to propose different systems. So as long as within the project budget, we can get cutting edge things, we are definitely open to it, right? So that's where that innovation perspective comes in, but our budgets are set. And part of the, you know, the, current uh, narrative there is that we shouldn't be, uh, or, you know, we shouldn't be building that much on, on a courthouse building, right? Because of, uh, of, the, of the issues that uh, are associated with uh, putting that much money into, into a single facility. Like if you look at our cost per square feet, we, we wanna be mindful of that. So. I think that's where the innovation from the design community comes into perspective. And that's really why we are scoring it. So you guys can come up with creative solutions to, to what we are looking at. Thank, thank you so much. So we have a few more questions here. Mark expanded on his question regarding um, flexibility in the program criteria to make target value design budget in your process. And I think maybe you addressed that. I don't know if you wanna go deeper. Kazu has a question as well as Grace. Kazu, did you want to ask your question? Hi. Um, so the um, cost model spreadsheet that the you know, potential DBE is to fill, are you going to be evaluating the, you know, the high and the low of the TGMP, or are you going to more evaluating how the GCs arrive to that TGMP? So that will be uh, called out into our RFP, but what we are gonna, we are gonna evaluate and rank these target GMPs because those are the real things. And if you are closer to us, right? We wanna hear the thought process on why your target is what it is. If you are saying, if we are saying it's 49 million and you are coming back and saying it's 65 million, we wanna know why you thought it was 65 million. And if you are the only one out of five people who is saying it's 65 and rest everybody says, well, we are at 50 or we are at 51, then we wanna know why, right? So that is kind of uh, gonna organically come from that. And it's gonna be an overall score on the target GMP just like everything else because uh, we will know how much thought process and how much work you have put into that. So I think, um, I can't say anything more other than that. I think look for the proposal and then that's why there's gonna be those confidential meetings. And we are gonna evaluate line item by line item rather than a whole uh, number as, as such. Thank you. And we also have a question from Grace. Grace, welcome to the call. Did you wanna ask your question? Sure, um, yeah, I was just curious. Um, if the IDIQ for the staff extension and project management consulting services will be released in 2023 as well? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's probably going to be in 2023. Uh, actually, uh, we have two years of it still remaining. So it'll be in 2024, I think, or late 2023, uh, because we ours is expiring in April. So we have a two-year extension on that. So that would put us into 2024. So it'll be coming last quarter of 2023, first quarter of 2024. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Any other questions? Andrew Miller, did you did you want to sort of bring up your question with regards to the uh, you know beyond the code and the twenty five you know the wider stairs, for instance? Um, no, I think it was answered. It was just understanding if it was going to be specified in the RFP of the additional above and beyond code requirements, just kind of to level the playing field during the competition, and probably to prevent fire marshal issues later on once the DB team is awarded. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, anyone think, else on the call? Oh, go ahead. I think I answered that one. We are looking at 20% additional capacity on the stairs in the occupant lord. Excellent. Well, I know everybody's busy and uh, you know we're all sort of overwhelmed. Um, I, I will share the recording, Carol. So this will we'll put it up on our the AIA YouTube page, and I'll also share it with uh, Jagan and, and Pella so they can share it as well. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll let everyone get back to their to their day. And um, you know, I'm really thankful for everyone's um, participation here. Let's do a round of applause. <laughs> well, I do have a comment. Oh yes, Andrew. Um, and because I'm getting text from a couple of people, I think one thing that was said that was good, bad, whatever, indifferent, but just a comment from our, the design and construction world is that the comment about <clears throat> companies working together and having a really big score, you might want to look at that because there's a lot of good firms that are forced to not work with who they want to because of too much weight being put on people, the two firms doing the projects together before. If that makes sense. So Andrew, it will have a certain score. I don't know if there is going to be like, this is going to overwhelmingly change the scoring for everybody else. But the reason is if you haven't worked together, you know, those are not hard, uh, easy discussions to happen with the, between the builder and the a &E when things are going south on a project. Uh, we want to know that you guys are comfortable working and will tie the project because as an owner, Nothing concerns me more if my builder and my architect are going opposite directions. And typically on a CMR, it happens, right? It happens more often than not. So maybe you haven't worked with that firm together in a DBE capacity, but you might have worked with them in a CMR or a design bid built environment. Uh, I, I don't know, but you need to have some sort of working relationship, if you're coming all brand new, things are, things take a bad turn, you know, that project is in trouble. I, I see what you're saying. I, I guess the part of it could be too, is a lot of times we see it as they want to see the two companies that work together, but nobody from either project are the people that are going to be on this project where we could have worked with a really great architect, let's say, and that person's changed companies, but now the company, the, the, the companies don't match, but the people still do. So and, you know, that, that's just that part of guess is where I'm going with it. Yeah, I, I, I guess if the key person has worked together in the past, you can bring that in. Uh, obviously, it's not the same thing as the two firms have worked together because, you know, there are decision makers about you and each company has a different culture than what it was where you guys worked together in the past. But yeah, definitely we will consider if you guys have worked together uh, in different firms together that the key person has worked together before, that is definitely helpful to know. Okay. Jake, Jake, and just to kind of follow up with what Andrew's saying, you know, from the perspective of the architecture firm, especially the smaller firm, there's a lot of inequity built into the design build process that isn't recognized. And I, I, I know that's beyond the scope of this call. We're, rec we're, we're looking to support your design build program as it is. But in the future, I think there's a lot of opportunity to really 
strengthen the delivery process so that you ensure greater equity, um, especially in this time of need when we really need to make sure that we're uh, recognizing smaller firms, dis disadvantaged firms, minority firms, women-owned firms, and we really must do more with procurement and project delivery to ensure those outcomes. Design build is um, sort of flawed with inequities, but we have to sort of figure out a way to improve that moving forward. And, and we would love to partner with you and all of the you know, state agencies in making sure that you know, project delivery and procurement become truly balanced. Um, but that's another conversation in the, in the near future. <laughs> So, Will, I hear what you're saying, and to, to that point, I would say that, you know, you don't need to have worked with a larger firm. Like, we're not looking for, you know, you, you to team up with Clark or Hansel Phelps on, on some project to get it. So, if you are a mid-size, smaller mid-size firm, and there is a smaller builder or mid-size builder who can build that project, right, and you guys can team up and come together, we would welcome that, right? Uh, but you gotta still stand on your uh, on your you know strengths in the proposal. But I think we have a lot of small mid mid sized projects where uh, where your where the smaller and mid sized firms can team up with smaller and mid sized construction firms. And I encourage you guys highly to do that because we are not looking for black cape uh, teams here, right? I'd rather have a better team from a mid-size firm, a team from a mid-size firm, than a seed uh, level team from a big firm. So, Bella, you wanna add anything else to that? No, I agree totally with you, Jagan, on that one. And to me, it, it's kind of getting the, the right collaborative entity to work on the right project and really, that the skills and strength of that team are tailored to the project. Um, we have a huge variety of projects. Um, we showed you the, the Willows, which is a historic renovation and in addition, we also have um, you know, smaller scale work in either renovation projects that we typically go to our IDIQs, or we also have some smaller one and two courtroom courthouses that'll be coming up um, hopefully here in the next few years that um, you know, are kind of some remote corners of California. So we'll be looking, you know, as for some of those smaller projects that the, you know, the total project construction will be 25 or 30 million. So trying to um, make sure you know, that the team has the skill sets is you know, really what we're seeking. Well, well, thank you so much for, for sharing the program with us. And um, I'll make sure that everybody that registered for this call has a, access to this link. And then if, if I, I believe there are a few questions with regards to if they could get access to your um, PowerPoint presentation, that will be helpful as well. We'll send it over. So thank, thank you so much and uh, look forward to staying in touch and everyone stay healthy and safe. and. Um, you know, stay together. We're, we're in this. Um, so thank you for your time and for your dedication.